Welcome to BMC Helix Emergent Days. In this breakout session, we're going to cover the capabilities of Remedy Force Self Service along with BMC Helix Chatbot. I'm Nikhil Deshpande. I'm a product manager for Remedy Force. Joining me in this session is Virginia Leandro, also a product manager for Remedy Force. In this session, we are going to cover the important capabilities of Remedy Force Self Service 3.0 will be laying emphasis on those capabilities of self-service that make our customers successful in their implementation or their deployment of self-service. We're also going to cover some of the newer capabilities of self-service through BMC Helix chatbot. I'll be covering the first part of the session focused on self-service and later on Virginia will be covering BMC Helix chatbot. Let's start with self-service 3.0. Let's start, let's start with understanding a brief history of tech support. Service management organizations have come a long way over the past 25 years or so. What was typically called a help desk in those days was a team that typically took calls from end users or end users would walk into the IT department and the agents would create tickets in the system. The end user interface was primarily through voice. At a time when call centers had become the primary medium to receive support on everything from toasters to televisions, this was a logical move by IT organizations to also provide their employees tech support on IT services. For the most part, end users were satisfied with this medium of receiving support. After all, what can be easier than calling a helpline? However, it placed immense burden on the help desk. As organizations grew, as they rolled out even more IT services powered by the tech revolution, they soon realized that this model of offering support was not scalable. There had to be a better way to automate the creation of tickets. The next tech revolution was the World Wide Web. This provides a solution to the previous problem. The web revolution was powered by the growth of the internet. Email adoption grew and it soon became the preferred mode of business communication. This revolution also so, saw a, a proliferation of web applications. An increase in the number of IT services led to an increase in the demand for tech support. An early technology intervention enabled the creation of tickets automatically through email listeners. End users just had to send an email to helpdesk at yourcompany.com. The system would automatically create tickets. End users liked this medium of asking for tech support. After all, what can be easier than sending an email to the helpdesk? This reduced the burden of creating tickets by helpdesk agents. It undoubtedly led to an improvement in helpdesk productivity. Yet, the system of creating tickets from emails had a fundamental problem. It simply automated the task of creation of tickets. It still relied on agents to act on those tickets. It still required an agent to inform the affected end user that what the st status of their ticket was. It required an agent's manual intervention to simply inform the end user what assets were issued to them. It still required an agent to inform the end user that, I, that an IT service was not accessible because of planned maintenance. Fast forward to the present day. We are in the midst of a digital revolution. Today's end users are far smarter and tech savvy than those in the past. This is especially true of millennials entering the workforce in large numbers, most of whom use social and mobile in their personal lives. They expect the same experiences when they interact with enterprise IT systems. They also want to solve their issues on their own. What they need is a self-service portal that provides them the information they are looking for. With BMC Helix Remedy Force, you have a self-service portal that your end users can access either from a desktop browser or through a mobile app. The experiences end users have with the portal are fundamentally different from responses they typically get from service desk agents, especially for routine requests for information. 
In many cases, the information they get from the service portal prevents the need to even create tickets. This not only provides your end users tools to help themselves, but also reduces calls to the service desk. The more the adoption of self-service grows, the better efficiencies your service desk realizes. This is the power of the Remedy Force self-service portal. So let's understand the breadth of everything that a self-service portal can do for an end user. So the question that arises is, why and what do end users go to the self-service portal for? It is erroneous to assume that end users go to the self-service portal to create tickets. The reality is that th they go to the self-service portal to find information. If we can fulfill their information needs without the need to create incidents, not only does it provide them a superior experience, it also reduces the burden of handling incidents by the service desk. By far, incidents may still be the single largest activity that your end users perform in a self-service portal. But if they have to create incidents, let's make sure that they follow or they use incident templates which encourage end users to provide complete information that service desk required to fulfill those issues. Incident templates also allow the service desk to automatically populate certain fields on the incident so that end users are not do not have to be prompted to enter those values. Service requests are another way of reducing the volume of incidents. Not only do they help you get complete information. There's far more to service requests than just com getting complete information from an end user. Service requests typically create tasks or change requests. And the tasks or change requests that are created usually have a templated process. There's always a process of how a service request is fulfilled by the service desk. The agents to whom these tasks or change requests are assigned are familiar with what those tasks are, how to fulfill them, and through repeated execution, they have mastered the art of efficiently and effectively fulfilling those tasks. Then there are self-help articles. End users today want to use the knowledge base, and you have an opportunity of providing self-help articles in the self-service portal. One feature of the Remedy Force self-service portal is the ability to view videos. If you create self-help articles with embedded videos, then your self-service portal can leverage those videos and this can provide an even better experience for your end users. You can allow your end users to know what assets are assigned to them. This is especially important so that the service desk transparently shares information with end users on what assets or services they have access to. One, one incident that I can remember is of a friend of mine who, when he was about to leave his previous job, on the last day of his employment, the IT department informed him that he was supposed to return a mobile phone that was issued to him more than five years back. Now this came as a complete shock to him. He thought he had already returned the phone. However, according to the CMDB records, he had not. And now on the last day, he had to contend with a phone that was issued to him and that he was expected to return to the IT help desk. If you're able to transparently share asset information with end users, the assets they are assigned, these shocks can be avoided. Remedy Force enables you to do that. There's service health that allows you to transparently share outage information or service disruption information with end users. And this is more than just announcing an outage. You can handle the entire life cycle of an outage until the service becomes available and this information can be transparently shared through the self-service portal. You can share broadcasts with end users. Broadcasts can be service outages, Broadcast can also be any other information that you may want to share, any news that you may want to share with your end users. This could be about changes to the service desk, changes to maybe your help desk phone numbers, or it could be about announcement of any new services, any new IT services that are about to be launched in the company. 
there are approvals which allow business users to approve requests. This can be done without purchasing a full Remedy Force license. Then there are custom links. You can include custom hyperlinks within the self service portal for your end users to use. There's live chat. We know that most employees or customers today already use live chat in consumer services in consumer or B2C portals. They expect the same services or the same kind of experiences in self service portals. Through Remedy Force, you can offer a live chat with an agent that allows an end user to interact with the agents and report their issues and get support. Finally, there's the power of cognitive service management, which BMC delivers through the BMC Helix chatbot. More on this later. I have now logged on to the self service portal and I'm going to take the persona of an end user. This end user is, uh, he's a business manager in charge of, uh, he, he leads a, a team of order services professionals and this team is responsible for entering orders. Now let's look at a few of the use cases that our user will use the self-service portal for. The history of this user is that until recently he did not use the self-service portal and would typically send an email to help desk or he would simply call the help desk. He's recently been trained on using the self-service portal. Now let's see how he uses the portal for his information needs. When he logs into the self-service portal, he sees the broadcast banner. So he sees there are two broadcasts, one announcing a change in toll-free numbers for Skype. And the second is an outage on the middleware system. So this is the first opportunity for this user to become aware of any news that the service desk wants to share with him. On a typical day, he will typically read these notices or these broadcasts. But today is a busy day and he doesn't read those. He wants to report that he's facing an outage in the ERP system. He suspects that there's an outage. He's unable to connect to the ERP. So what it does is he simply starts typing in this search box. As he does this, as he enters the search query, search results start appearing real time. There are three self-help articles and when he glances over them, he sees none of them are relevant. He can see that there's a service request. Let's see if it's relevant. No, this isn't relevant to what he's looking for. Then he sees there's a broadcast and here he sees that there's a there's an outage on middleware which affects the ERP system which, uh, which is exactly the problem that he's facing. If he clicks that, he'll have more information about the outage. He can know when that outage was posted. He can also read any other outages or any other broadcasts that have been posted here. Let's say he, despite reading this, if he still wants to submit a ticket, you'll notice that this button appears at the bottom and he has an opportunity here to submit a ticket. Note that until he does this, until he searches for something, there was no opportunity for him to submit a ticket. Note that we have not provided a submit a ticket link here in the self-service portal. And this is precisely the power of self-service. What we have built is a complete workflow of searching for information and if, if the information needs are fulfilled then there is no need to submit a ticket but if indeed the user does need to submit a ticket they can do so after they have browsed through the search results once it clicks on submit a ticket the search string that he had entered in the search box is automatically copied onto the description field now he can enter any other field such as category he also, you'll notice that he also has smart suggestions. Smart suggestions is, uh, are th these are populated real time based on the query entered in some fields such as category and description. 
and we see similar results have come in smart suggestions as they had in the super box so here's a second opportunity for him to be aware that there is already a broadcast related to the issue that he's going to report so here's a second opportunity to prevent a ticket from being submitted if he fails to notices or if he f feels that there is still a need to submit a ticket then he can go ahead and click on the submit button Now let's look at the next use case. The holiday season is coming up and in order to deal with the increased volume of business during the holiday season, this user wants to hire a few employees, a few contract employees. So he goes to the super box and he searches The first of his contract employees is coming on board today and he needs to em onboard the new employee. So enters this search string. He reads that there are a few self-help articles, none of which seem to be relevant. Then he goes to the service request tab. He can see that there are seven search results here. And here he sees the very first result is onboard a new employee. Once he clicks this, he can see the service request form which will allow him to enter the details of his new hire. Note that this form is displayed in two columns. Now, at this question, does your new hire require additional system access? He's not sure if this hire will be required to have access to any other system, such as collections. Now, what does he do? He wants to save this request, but until he has filled in all the required fields, he will not be able to submit this request. What it does is it clicks on Save Draft. And when it does that, all the details that he entered on the form are saved as a draft. Draft service requests are not submitted in the system. They remain as draft and the client or the end user has an opportunity to go back to the drafts, review them and submit them. So you note, you'll notice that the count of drafts here increased from 0 to 1. He can go back to the drafts, open the draft request fill in additional details, fill in all the required fields, and then submit the request. If he sees that the draft request is no longer relevant, he can also delete the draft from here. Now let's look at the next use case. This user is facing an issue with his printer. He's unable to connect to his printer. How can he report that issue? One is through the common ticket template that he sees on the home page. If he clicks this, he can submit his issue. The second way is to describe his issue here in the search box. And as we saw, he could even uh, uh, he could enter it in the search box and then click on the submit link ticket at the bottom. A third way for him to submit this ticket is to click on view my assets. When he clicks here, he sees a list of all those assets and CIs, including services, that uh, have been assigned or that this user is linked with. So he sees there's a smartphone, there's a printer, and there's a laptop. Now this is precisely the printer with which he's facing issues. So from here, he can click a submit ticket link. He selects the appropriate category and then enters Note, notice that the CI or asset 
for his printer has automatically been populated here. Now let's submit the incident. Ticket number 104. If he clicks on the related tickets link, he will see his ticket here along with any other tickets that he has opened. These tickets can also be exported to CSV. He can also view tickets that he has created on behalf of others. Let's note, let's find out what was different in the incident that he just submitted. The ticket that was created was 104. Now let's open this ticket in the console. And there's one thing that was distinctly different than any other ticket that would have been uh, that, are, that he has submitted here. If you open the services and CI section on this incident, note that the CI asset field was automatically filled. And this is very important information because if he hadn't done that, typically the service desk agent would have had to populate this field manually. Not only does it increase the burden of the service desk, it can also lead to errors in terms of data errors. Maybe a wrong printer was selected in populating the CI. So these issues can be minimized if you allow or if you encourage your end users to submit tickets from the view assets link within the self-service portal. Now let's go back to self-service. And then our next use case is approvals. This user has direct reports and one of them gently reminds him that he needs to approve a few service requests that has been that have been sent to him for approvals. Now when these service requests were sent to him for approval, he would have received email notifications. So if he goes to his mailbox, he'll be able to see those notifications and he also has an opportunity of approving requests from within email. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he comes to the self service portal and here he sees all those pending requests. So he sees uh, every request that is pending his approval. The, op the advantage of approving from self-service portal is that here he has an opportunity to view the entire record which he cannot do in email. He can view all the details of the request. He can even view any attachments if any on the request. He can look at the approval history. So when he looks at the approval history here, he can see that the the request was originally submitted to someone else and it has been reassigned to him. If any comments had been entered, those would have been displayed here. So from here, he can now approve or reject this request or reassign to someone else. He can also approve multiple requests at a time from within the self-service portal. Now based on the behavior of this user, the service desk has realized that here's a user who has adopted self-service in a big way. There's a project they're undertaking. The service desk is soon to launch service health and they want to start small. They want to allow access to the service health dashboard to just a handful of users initially. They want to start with a pilot and they have selected this user in that pilot. Now you can see that he does not see service health in the self service portal. What we are going to do is go back to admin and see how we can grant him access. So go to configure self service, tile visibility and order, and this is where you would add view service health. The new change in summon 19 is this entitlement link. When you click on the entitlement link, here you have an opportunity to decide or configure who is entitled to this tile. In this case, we want to allow access to service health to just a few users. So let's say you created this permission set called service health power users. 
you can grant them access along with any other permission sets that you want to grant access to and click on save the next thing you need to do as an admin is add the all those users who need access to service health all of them have to be linked to this permission set so this user let's grant him this permission set Now let's go back to self-service. Now we can see that the user sees view service health in self-service. And from here he'll be able to access the service health of all, all those services that he has access to. Finally, there's custom links. From custom links, you can, as admins, you can add any custom links that uh, you may want your end users to have access to. Here I've added two links, launch chatter and change password. If you use sales, if you use Salesforce chatter in your company for collaboration among employees, you can add a link to chatter from within the self service portal and this will directly take you to chatter within Salesforce. Secondly, the second link is change password link. Change password link directly takes you to the Salesforce page where the user has an opportunity to change their password. Note that this is applicable only if you don't use single sign-on. If you use SSO, then this link will not work. Then you, you would have a different way to change for your end users to change their SSO passwords. That brings us to the end of the self-service section. I now hand off to Virginia to take you through chatbot. Thanks Nikhil. My name is Virginia Leandro and I'm one of the product managers for Remedy Force. Service management as a category is being disrupted by technologies like AI and machine learning, chatbots, virtual agents, and Internet of Things, driving dramatic changes to how enterprises provide service in the future. Business leaders who are highly cognizant of this wave are jumping in headfirst and applying these technologies to solve real business challenges and get a competitive edge in the market. The BMC Helix chatbot is the starting point of bringing cognitive services to your end users so they can request services and search knowledge when and where they need it. This helps automate some of the level zero and level one service requests, and all of this is powered leveraging IBM Watson Assistant. Let's take a look at some of the key features. Organizations can improve employee experience and productivity by providing the ability to use natural language conversation to find the desired solutions and knowledge for their issues. Keep in mind the chatbot can be used for other purposes that may not be directly related to what happens within Remedy Force or IT. Things like help desk hours, redirect to internal links could all be part of what your chatbot could do. Additionally, users can quickly see the status of their requests simply by asking the bot. In addition to the chatbot helping users complete requests, the chatbot can be a source of knowledge by asking clarifying questions and help guide the user to the right knowledge articles. Users can provide feedback on the knowledge that was provided. With interactive messages, you can configure the chatbot to help guide the user in their answers, making sure that the information you're getting is accurate and correct. Self-service must be intuitive. Employees want to interact with IT the way they interact with their friends and the services in their personal lives. Simply, easily, anywhere and on any device. Employees want more flexibility when accessing knowledge and submitting service requests. Current channels include Slack and SMS. We have plans on verifying Skype on-premise as well as Microsoft Teams. We also can work with Skype Online Business Office 365. However, Microsoft recently announced that feature will be deprecated. 
The BMC Helix Chatbot also comes with a web widget that can be embedded within internal web pages as well. And additionally, you can configure the chatbot to recognize the language of the user's browser and have the chatbot respond to them in their language. So let's have a look, quick look at the chatbot in action. Here, Jackson Smith is logged into self-service and he can launch the chatbot quite easily. And the chatbot knows who Jackson is and greets him and says, hey, I'm here to help you, what can I do? And Jackson says, I'd like to get a status of my requests. The chatbot will go off and uh, bring back uh, requests that, that Jackson has submitted. Here's one for time off. It's supposed to start on September 30th, so this tells Jackson that if it's still submitted, that means his boss hasn't approved it yet, so we might want to go down the hall and have a chat with him. Jackson also has a new employee starting in a couple of weeks, so Jackson says, yeah, there is something else. I have a new hire. And the chatbot can help with that. It says, immediately goes into, can you provide their, their first name? Sure, Sally. Last name is going to be Smith. And Sally's going to be joining October 10th. And Sally's going to be full-time. And no, I don't have any additional comments. She's going to need a desktop. And she's going to need a wireless keyboard mouse. She's not going to need a phone. Um, no additional system access at this point and no additional details. And now the chatbot will uh, submit my request. So it's gathered all this information and now the chatbot has submitted the service request and returned the, re the number as well as a hyperlink. The hyperlink will actually take me into the request itself. From here I can also uh, ask about uh, help with email. So how do I manage my Outlook? And the chatbot will go off and it's found uh, one article. I can go ahead and review it within the chatbot window. Uh, if I was on my iPhone, I'd have the same experience of being able to look through it. Uh, in the chatbot here, we also have the ability to take that user to the larger uh, self-help article if they'd like to see it in a different view. So no chatbot discussion is complete without talking about best practices. So first up, let's talk about planning. One of the first things I advise customers to do is first determine what you want the chatbot to help with and how it will do it. We recommend you start small, maybe five use cases, and then grow from there. Typically, when you're looking at your service request, you want something that lends itself easily to a conversation. But also, if you have a service request with 30 inputs, that's probably not a good use case for the chatbot. You want things that are small, quick, and easy. If, you're, if you end up in an instant message with somebody, typically if it starts getting very detailed, at some point you want to pick up the phone and talk to that person because it's going to be a lot easier. Same thing with the chatbot. Anything more than five or ten questions, you're probably going to lose your audience and they're going to want to either use the regular form where they can save it and come back to it later or they'll end up just calling IT out of frustration. Take this opportunity to uh, update your knowledge base and make sure that it's, it's ready for the chatbot as well. As we continue to brace multi-channel, think of other ways your users may engage. You'll want to consider channels your users are already using, selecting those channels, defining a campaign to roll out internally and set targets for usage. Uh, we definitely recommend you start with a beta test group and really work with them on a day-to-day -day basis, seeing what questions they're asking and how the chatbot can help in those, in those inquiries. And then communicate, you know, it, whether it's the beta group or as you begin to roll the chatbot out to the larger audience, you'll want to make sure that you can uh, cre uh, communicate value timelines and enablement opportunities and schedule re regular and frequent communications as well as collect feedback 
uh, to measure both the, the chatbot effectiveness and to improve the chatbot. When it comes to implementing the chatbot, you won't need to train your chatbot. While the Watson Assistant uses natural language processing dialogues, think of creating a corpus of, with data for the determined use cases. You know the language of your company and your industry better than anyone, and so you'll want to be able to uh, train the chatbot to, to utilize some of those uh, conversations. You'll also want to think about giving your chatbot a personality. Do, do you want your chatbot to be chatty? Do you want it to, to uh, greet people with uh, maybe the, uh, you know, the weather or something like that? You know, again, you can, you can, you determine how chatty you want the chatbot to be, but make sure that it, it's, it reflects your image and the brand that you want to relate within the organization. And then operating. As much as I'd like to say chatbots are set it and forget it, they're not. They're just like a team member. You need to invest time and help them grow. You want to continue to monitor and fine-tune the chatbot usage and the performance of the chatbot. You'll also probably want to look at what people are asking about and incorporate those use cases back into the chatbot uh, in order to make the chatbot better and to help users with their questions. And finally, we have a number of resources that we can recommend. Uh, if you're not familiar with IBM Watson Assistant, there's some great tutorials out there. There's a lot of ton of information uh, that you can um, read up on and look at some of the details. We also have resources here for from the Helix chatbot technical uh, documentation that will let you uh, uh, sort of see what the capabilities are of the chatbot. We thank you for your attendance and we appreciate your time. Thank you.